everyone. This week's a really big episode. So talking about principle three this week for agile org transformation, and that principle is that doing the work and improving the work is the work. All too often I go into uh, work with clients and we start taking a look around their organization. You have a whole bunch of people that are sitting there doing their jobs, but all of those change and improvement um, initiatives that we that we put into our business, well, they're all decided by somebody back in head office. And then a project team go away and do a whole bunch of work on them and roll them out to the rest of the organization. And those people that are closest to the risk and the opportunity and your customers have very, very little say in how that goes about. Even if we're doing engagement sessions, even if we're building cross-functional teams, it's that mindset around centralized control of change and improvement programs. That's what we're going to get under uh, this episode. So what we want to move to is a philosophy and a mindset that says, actually, those people on the front line, closest to our customers, closest to the risk, the opportunity, we actually want them to be driving these change initiatives. We want that change to be coming from them, where it matters for our customers, and we want that to help us to build this responsive organization. And then people that are in back of house, their role is to support that change and improvement that is driven by the people that are on the front line. This is a big one. This is actually probably the principle that makes you want to puke the most when you go about trying to implement it. So uh, what happens is that when when you start to empower teams to make decisions in this way, uh, when you start to enable them to make some of those decisions, uh, first off, it's really jarring for team members themselves because they're used to having people give them a bunch of instruction. But they take to it like ducks to water, and they usually tend to dive right on in. give it sort of six, nine months and you start to run into this decision-making fatigue and you've got to do a bunch more work to really kind of boost everybody's resilience because all of a sudden they're in the driving seat for a whole bunch of decisions that they just never had a part of earlier. And it's also a big mindset shift for leaders too, right? Because it takes away from that core piece around we add value by giving answers. You've heard me rant about the education system before. When was the last time you got points on an exam for asking a great question rather than giving an answer. This stuff is ingrained in us. It's ingrained in us as leaders. It gets worse when you're highly intelligent, very capable, and you've been doing it for a long time and you made it to the corner office because everything you've done to date has got you to that position of success. And now it's about kind of turning that all on its head and that feels really, really uncomfortable. So it's a big mindset shift for leaders to make as well in terms of How do I enable my teams to make more of those decisions? And it plays into this concept of centralized visibility, but decentralized control. And what we want to do is make sure that as teams are making these decisions, there's visibility across the organization for those that are impacted, there's visibility back centrally, uh, but we want to still enable those teams to make those decisions. And if there's something that's a really big, maybe it doesn't happen very often, um, or it's got a long-term impact, then maybe that's the point that we start to pull those decisions back and go, oh, hang on a minute, let's bring it back internally to um, to a core team that can really get out across the entire organization. And, and you can drive that decision, but actually we probably want to make that decision, decision centrally. So there's this balance and this interplay, right? It's not total chaos. However, it's challenging because we're trying to give away Uh, a lot of what we feel is our power, our mana as leaders. Uh, And that feels uncomfortable on so many levels. So it's going to work on you as an individual. It's going to work on you internally, your emotional landscape and how you show up. But equally, it's going to have massive, massive impact on your business as you start to implement this. So part of the other reasons I think this principle is particularly difficult to work with is it's really tied to our notions of hierarchy. So in our organizations, when we talk about restructures, uh, when we talk about change, we often draw boxes and lines on paper with a whole bunch of people in those boxes and we shuffle them around. But, but that org chart, it's like it's one of our fundamental tools, right? We have this ingrained notion that as we get more experience, more expertise, better skilled, we ascend up an organizational chart. Uh, And we are in a position where we're able to make more of those decisions because we have the training, we have the know-how, we have the experience. Now, I am in no way diminishing all that has brought you to this place. However, part of why implementing this principle around allowing teams to make more decisions 
part of why it really gets to us is because it's getting to this ingrained notion of hierarchy that we're carrying around on a conscious or subconscious level. Human beings are social creatures, we form hierarchies naturally, it's totally okay. The bit that I've got an issue with is when those hierarchies become static. And so what I've found is a really, really helpful way to think about uh, different uh, skill sets, different capabilities, different experience levels in organizations is rather than putting that down on paper as a hierarchy, actually for me what it comes down to is it's that various people have various spheres of influence. If you've got somebody that's just starting in the organization, their sphere of influence is quite tight and quite small. If they're very junior in terms of their mastery of a skill set, same thing. Their ability to influence others is probably tied quite closely to those around them, as opposed to being able to influence a much broader group um, with a level of confidence and, I guess, a level of authority around that influence. As we get more experience, as we've been in organizations for longer, uh, as we have had tenure, uh, as we just start to kind of curate those necessary gray hairs, we, uh, we build that sphere of influence. And so our ability to influence people uh, both across and also within our organization is enhanced. And so some of us have spheres of influences that are much wider, much greater than uh, others. That's totally okay. That mental model helps me to start to think about, or to start to think less about hierarchy and to start to think more about enablement. It's a real tool. It's, a, it's one of these mind hacks about how do I get myself out of some of these ingrained patterns that I may not even know uh, are going on. So it's going to get to your sense of, of hierarchy, uh, but it's also going to have some really interesting uh, effects on your organization as you start to allow people to make more decisions uh, out in the work. What's going to happen is that all of a sudden the organization is going to start to move faster, which is what we want going to start to get this more responsive nature because we can start to make change in the moment. We can start to have an impact for our customers in the moment. And all of a sudden what happens is that it feels like the entire organization is running away from us because what's happening is it's moving faster than we're comfortable with. And that again is one of those points of internal reflection around part of building a responsive organization. Part of the bit that they don't show you on the profile pic is that the organization starts to move when you when you build this responsiveness in and, and it starts to move faster than many of us are comfortable with. And so then there's a whole bunch of self-work that goes on around that, but also a bunch of work around how do we set up these structures so that we can enable the organization to move forward, but these structures don't clamp down and, and shut down that innovation and that responsiveness. Instead, we want them to enhance that and enable us to do it in a way that still maintains that visibility, that cohesion, uh, and some level of guidance around and structure around where we're trying to go. Uh, I spoke recently, sorry, I was watching uh, Dave Snowden speak recently, and uh, it's, a, it's a talk from back, I think it was about 2016, but he had this great analogy which, um, which really struck me when I was thinking about this topic, and that's this idea of different types of skeletons. Insects have an exoskeleton. And so the structure builds the shape of the animal. There's a whole bunch of change that could go on on the inside, but that shape of, of, of the animal itself doesn't necessarily change much. It's much like a lot of our traditional structures around hierarchies, around policy and procedure, and all these things that are baked into our organization. What we're looking for in building responsive organizations is an endoskeleton, much like our own. Uh, as mammals, we have a spine, we have bones, we have structure, but it enables a lot of variation to go on on the outside of that structure in a way that's just not possible with that uh, exoskeleton. And so conceptually what we're trying to do is we, we absolutely we need structure, but it's not going to look a lot like the structures that we're used to. It's going to look and feel a lot different. And we need to be consciously, continuously questioning ourselves around how is this enabling autonomy, mastery, purpose within our people? How is this enabling that visibility so that we can give control? And how is it keeping that clarity so that people are making decisions within the context of the broader whole? Um, so that's, that's most of it this way. I've just dumped a whole bunch on you and I'm going to dump one more thing. Um, I really think you should go and watch, if you haven't watched already, Dave Marquette's talk on greatness. He's talking a lot about the dispelling of this leader and follower myth. And, uh, and there's one quote that really sings out to me in his application of um, 
servant leadership principles and, and this enabling culture within naval submarines. And he says, in most submarines, you have one Muppet at the top that's pulling all the strings, telling everybody what to do. And there's 134 people that are following orders. He says, in my ship, you have 135 thinking, breathing, living, responsive human beings who are able to make their own decisions in context of what's going on around them, and they're able to drive that change and improvement. They're able to make those decisions. It means that we're so much more responsive. Um, we're so much quicker to respond to what's coming at us. And essentially, you don't stand a chance. That's the point that we want to get to with our organizations. How do we build those structures that enable us to be responsive and that enable the organization to be fluid and to move faster than we are comfortable with as leaders? So there's a big chunk of self-work that's required in this one. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of structures and processes and policy um, and procedure that looks probably a lot different to what we currently have in our organization. So uh, that's it. That's principle number three. Doing the work and improving the work is the work. It's a huge aspiration, and uh, and it can take a long time to see the full implementation, but I promise you that if you start implementing uh, decisions, if you start thinking about your environment in this way, you start to give that control back to those people who are closer to the risk and the opportunity, you're going to see results within a 24-hour period. It's immediate, the change in your organization, and then it continues to evolve and it continues to grow uh, over the period of time. So uh, that's it from me this week. Um, I hope that's been a little bit thought-provoking, potentially a little bit kind of uncomfortable for you. Um, drop me a comment below. I would love to hear from you. Send me an email. Hit me up on the social media. Uh, I hope wherever you are in the world today, you're having an awesome, awesome day. And I will see you again next week.